change. We've changed color. The color change tells us that agriculture has moved into northern Illinois and Chicago has gotten significantly larger. If we move forward now, there's a, um, actually we're going to take another look at 1830 there just by comparison. And now we're going to jump up to 1950. Now we have a big difference in the city of Chicago. It is starting to sprawl out there and we're doing what's changing land cover. Land cover has changed pretty significantly here in Northern Illinois at this point. If we jump forward to the year 2000, now we're looking at a really big change for the Chicago metropolitan area. And our green spaces have really shrunk pretty significantly. And when water hits something that's this different than a green area, it behaves very differently. And we're gonna take a closer look at that a little bit later. Now let's jump up into the future a little bit. Six years from now is the year 2030. So what's that gonna look like? Now we're looking at this for the city of Chicago. And again, our green spaces, we see a little bit of things popping up in there where we have opportunities for green space, open space within our city limits, but it's still really very different from when we jump back to 1830, heck of a lot of green space, and we jump forward again to 2030, that green space has really disappeared. What does that mean? What's happened in that time frame? If we go back to the 1930s, this is something you've probably learned about in class. The Dust Bowl came through at that time. Settlers in the Midwest had removed those native prairie plantings that we saw, and they planted crops, but those crops are only covering the ground for part of the year. Then a drought came along in the 1930s, and it killed even those measly plants off, and the soil was completely exposed. Wind then picked up that soil from Oklahoma and actually dropped it off all the way as far east as the Atlantic Ocean. Recognizing that that was a major problem, people called for help. So the response from the government is to put together the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. This is a locally organized and operated unit of government that is uh, under state law, and it promotes the protection, maintenance, improvement, and wise use of soil and water related resources within that district. We work in conjunction with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is a federal organization, and partner together, we're taking care of our soil and water here. This is our local team here in Kane and DuPage County. This is our soil and water conservation team. So what does a soil and water conservation district actually do though? Well, there's 112, 102 counties in Illinois. The first of us soil and water districts was formed in 1938. There are 98 of us. Some of us double up like Kane and DuPage counties are together in one district. We formed as a partner for conservation under the Illinois Department of Agriculture. And that's a unique situation in Illinois. Other states don't work it quite the same way. We have an elected board of directors, there's five of them, that actually direct what work we're going to be doing at the Soil and Water District. And our work, we will respond to threats to the land's natural resources. We will address landowners' resource concerns. And we have chosen to accept our mission of supporting sustainable agriculture and sustainable urban development. Now water, let's think about water. Is it an inexhaustible natural resource? No, this is the same water that we've always had. It's the same water that the dinosaurs drank millions of years ago, and it's all the water that we will ever have. In fact, 75% of the earth is made up of water. We are the blue marble, the blue planet. That water is captured in atmosphere, in inland lakes, rivers, ice, oceans, fresh lakes, groundwater, 97% of it is salt water and is located in the oceans. The remaining 3% of water is actually fresh water. 79% of that fresh water is contained in our ice caps and the remainder is in groundwater, but that makes up just very little of the water we actually have access to. Just a little over a half a percent of the earth's water. So of all the water on the planet, just a half a percent of it is accessible to us in groundwater. And yet that groundwater makes up 96% of the world's accessible freshwater supply. This is where we get the water that we drink and use for our day-to-day -day lives. So groundwater, what exactly is groundwater? It's water that's found anywhere on earth. 
It's found below the surface of the earth and it fills in little air spaces, pockets in the actual structure of the soil. It is an extremely precious resource. It's used in industry, agriculture, it's, it's used by municipal and private water supplies. In fact, in all, one billion gallons of groundwater is used every day, displaced for one human use or another. It is not a separate resource, but it's rather one of the forms that water takes as it moves over the surface of the earth. Under your feet right now, where we're standing, this is what the ground looked like, looks like if we were to cut it away. The blue bands in there are what are called aquifers, and this is the place where the groundwater is stored. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. And the water everywhere exists in a watershed. Now the landscape is made up of many in interconnected watersheds and within each watershed, all the water runs to the lowest point, a stream, a river or a lake. And along the way, it travels over the surface and it seeps into the soil and travels as that groundwater. As it goes, it is cleansed actually filtered by vegetation and soil before it enters those streams and lakes. The wetlands that we have around, they actually provide a storage bin for when we have really high rainfall, they will store water like a giant sponge, helping to prevent flooding. Now watersheds come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and they have a lot of different features. They can be hills, they can be mountains, they can be almost flat, rocky, marshy, farmland, rangeland, there can be towns and cities there. They exist everywhere on the world. And here we have the watersheds of North America. The different colors all represent larger watersheds in North America. That orange one that you see kind of slicing right through the middle of North, of North America, that is the Mississippi watershed. And that Mississippi watershed is our watershed. And wherever we live, we are part of a watershed. So we are going to hopefully, if this works appropriately, going to see a little something different here. Drive that on there and see if we can get this guy going. You don't have to listen to just me talk. Let's see if this will work. Oh, I think we're going to have some technical difficulties here. Here we go. Okay. So let's learn a little bit more about a watershed. Maybe, if we don't buffer. Come on. We can I do this. I think the was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, that looked paint. Um, my internet's gonna fail me here. Oh, that's a shame. Yep, okay. Well, that's too bad. All right, we'll skip over that part. So let's move on. Our local watersheds. So if we look at our area here in Northern Illinois, the Fox River watershed drains 11 counties and it's 1,720 square miles. And there it sits right at the top of Northern Illinois. This area is primarily agriculture, but heavily urban on the Eastern portion. On the other side of our uh, district here. We have the Des Plaines watershed. This drains six counties and 1,320 square miles. And there it sits there in the red, just to the east of the Fox watershed. But this area is very different. It is residential with just a little bit of agriculture and forested land. So the land cover there is very different than the Fox watershed. But let's focus on the Fox watershed since that's where we actually are. There's our Fox watershed. It starts up in Colgate, Wisconsin, and it drives all the way down to Ottawa, Illinois. It's 223 miles long, and there are some 2,000, almost 2,500 miles of streams in this watershed. It was born about 12,000 years ago as a part of the Wisconsin Glacier. The lighter gray that you see there is where the Wisconsin Glacier settled when it was here 12,000 years ago, and that's when it retreated, leaving us with glacial features such as these, Kettle Lakes, Cames, Ridges, Eskers, there's bedrock that's exposed, Fens, Outwashes. We actually have an incredibly diverse uh, landscape here, which is directly in response to that Wisconsin Glacier having come through here. 19 of the 20 different natural land cover types exist here in our Fox watershed. 
And the biological diversity here is quite astonishing. We have prairies, we have forests, we have wetlands, and it looks very different all throughout our Fox watershed. This is a picture taken right outside of Geneva here in Illinois. And the Fox River is a multi-purpose resource. It contributes critical habitat for wildlife. It serves as a valuable resource for recreation. It receives and assimilates pollution from a variety of different sources all around the area. And it provides a source of water for our public water supplies. The watershed modifications that we make as humans, urbanization, they have had a significant impact on the dynamics of our river and its habitats and its inhabitants. Resources are being threatened. We have 153 threatened and endangered species according to the state of Illinois. One is federally endangered and two are federally threatened and they fall into these different categories. And it's really a shame that we have, have had such an impact on our watershed that we are actually driving out the species that belong in this area. How we're living on the land really makes an impact on that. When we look at the native peoples and how they lived here, they lived within the landscape with temporary structures utilizing the abundant resources around them. The bison trails that came through this area became their game trails for hunting. And here are some of the tribes that actually lived on the footprint of the Fox River watershed. Then, as you are probably aware, in around 1830s, there were several different Native American conflicts. The Black Hawk War was one of them, and some treaties resolved from all of this, and it ended up driving some of these people, and all of these people actually, off their land. And settlers came in, in their place. Now, it actually started back in the 1600s with the French explorers coming in, but then the 1840s settlement along the river really started. There was still abundant food and fertile land, so people really wanted to live here. There was enough timber, there was enough water. They started changing and controlling the landscape around with cutting and clearing. They put in sawmills and grist mills. We built permanent structures. When you replace natural vegetation with an impervious surface, impervious means that your water cannot trickle down through it, it diminishes the ability of the land to absorb the water and remove pollutants. Those game trails that were being used for hunting, they became roads. And the river, that became a disposal path, a garbage dump for where you send your trash away. In reality, there is no such thing as a way. It's always going to be here. We just can't see it anymore when we send it to a landfill or down the river. So it's two different ways of living upon the land. We have either an egocentric or an ecocentric perspective. And there's a, a, an in, environmentalist named Aldo Leopold who said that he, we abuse the land because we see it as a commodity which is belonging to us. But when we see the land as a community to which we actually belong, then we'll start to treat it with some respect and some love. This is what the natural water cycle looks like. We're going to talk about aquifers a little bit more now. So let's follow those drops. Nature circulates water, manages water supplies, and cleans it along the way. We can't create water, but we can make it too polluted for us to use and interrupt some of these water cycles here. So what does it look like when we've changed the landscape? So as opposed to the water system that Mother Nature has, this is an urban water system. There's a lot of what we call impervious surfaces, so not much water actually makes it down into the ground. And during a really heavy rain, flooding comes along, and that can also cause erosion and polluted runoff. So these man-made water management systems that were uh, developed in response to these erosion and um, uh, rainfall events were supposed to help to mitigate some of that, to make it not so bad. So what we see here is um, opportunities to send your stormwater straight in a storm drain, which is not filtered, straight into the water, the water sources. We can send them through a sanitary wastewater systems, which takes it over to our waste treatment plant. And then it gets treated, hopefully, before it gets dumped out. But in a heavy rain event, overflow is going to get dumped out. Uh, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, these run directly off of fields 
into our waterways. So that's actually unfiltered, uncleaned uh, water. It's an unfortunate situation that when we bypass Mother Nature's systems, that we end up creating pollution in the waterways. And I sense that there might be some questions here. Okay, what do we got? Okay, so the first one is, can you explain what a seep and fen are? Ah, okay, a seep and a fen, those are two different, actually very wonderful, rare uh, formations that uh, where groundwater bubbles up to the surface and a seep is, is literally water seeping out of the ground from the groundwater. And a fen is a, a particular geological formation that has very specific plantings in that place. And these are very rare. We actually have both of those. The only seeps and fens that exist in the state of Illinois exist in the Fox River watershed. Okay, and then another question is, how can urban areas increase the green spaces within the city? That's a great question. And that's something where if, if we do increase those green spaces, we are offering opportunities for Mother Nature to help us to filter and slow down our water. We have to make a conscious decision to install those green spaces. That's some of the options that we have as residents on the land to make changes that are going to make a positive impact. So we have to make those decisions on, on an individual level, on a municipal level, on a state level, to make sure that we protect open space and green space. All right, so the next one is, no, 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 do, you, do you think that the dams on the Fox River should be removed? That is a very involved question, something we probably don't have time for today. There are positives and negatives on both sides of that conversation. Um, there's a lot of positive impact on and the environment and the habitat and the creatures that live in the river. And there's also some impacts that are going to change the way we live along the river, the river if, we, if we change those dams out. So it's a longer conversation. There's a lot of information available um, from the Fox uh, River at study groups that you can look up online and learn more. Okay, so the next question is, as glaciers melt into the ocean during, due to a warming climate, does all that fresh water become salt water? That depends on where it is and how it's moving along. It is going to uh, dilute our oceans as it melts out. Um, if the, the glaciers exist on a land mass, then obviously that water has an opportunity to infiltrate into the soil. But uh, primarily when you see the, the calving and the, the um, icebergs that are melting and all that, that's going to dilute into our ocean water and it will become salt water. All right. And then the next one is, is there any way to convert salt water to fresh water to increase our fresh water supply? There are several different technologies that are available for that. They are intensive. Um, and obviously, you have to be located in an area where you can do that. Uh, but it can be done. It certainly can be done. And there are projects in place that are doing that today. Okay, and the final question is, how has human activity and industry impacted the quality and availability of water sources over time? Ah, pretty significantly. It's a, That's a big question. So the more we cover the ground with impervious surfaces that cannot allow water to infiltrate down and recharge our aquifers, and we're going to talk more about that a little bit later, obviously the, the less water is going to be available to us. And some of the processes that we have in industry are very highly water intensive and they need that same clean water that we're trying to use to drink. So it's, it's a, a question of allocating our resources appropriately so that people have enough water to drink while we still have the water that we need to do our industrial processes. Okay, move on. All right. So let's talk about the water supply in the Fox River Shed. Do you know where your water is coming from? Over 225,000 people in our area rely on the Fox River directly for their drinking water. And everyone else, they take their water from the groundwater. Approximately a third of the Illinois population as a whole does drink from the groundwater. On average, a one single human uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water every day. And here we're going to talk about, oh, my aquifers didn't come up on there, um, how the water is impaired in the Fox River. So we've learned a lot about the water cycle, and there's a lot of threats that are involved in how that water comes down. This is where we're talking about that industrial impact. 
agriculture. We have nutrients that are, are leaching off of the fields. We have sediment that's running off the field with erosion. We're altering our habitats. And there's also bacteria that comes off of an, any kind of animal um, farms. Residentially, we're managing our yards, we're putting fertilizers down on our lawns. There's stormwater that's that's not able to infiltrate as well. So we're losing our wetlands and open spaces, the things that we talked about a little bit earlier. Construction sites have erosion areas as they're trying to build a new building, stuff is gonna erode around it. We're uh, dumping pharmaceuticals into our waters, the dams, the channelization, the destabilization of the, of the uh, shores. We've got sewage that's going in there. Industries are throwing some toxins in there. Some of those toxins are even permitted. So that's an unfortunate situation that we have to address as well. But the Fox River is listed as impaired today, according to the Illinois EPA. Now, things that we need to do to combat this situation. Back in 1972, we did get the Clean Water Act. It's been in place for over 50 years, but we still have a lot of work to do. It has two phases to it that it addresses two different situations. The ultimate goal is to make the water fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. And the first part was to take a look at point sources of pollution. This is the industry and wastewater treatment facilities, things that are dumping out from, say, there's a tube going directly into the water dumping junk. The other phase of this is everything else, the stuff that's coming off of non-point sources, erosion running off of agricultural fields, stormwater, other runoff like that, where it's pulling uh, pollutants off of the surface of the, of the land and pulling it down into the water. The results of these not taking care of these situations is going to be things like combined sewer overflow. This situation happened right here in Lake Michigan. A lot of people drink Lake Michigan water. And here is Milwaukee Harbor with a sewer stormwater runoff, domestic sewage and industrial wastewater dumping right out into the Milwaukee Harbor. Yes, that is water that people are going to be drinking. Here's a situation up in Lake Erie. This is a satellite image that shows an algae bloom, cyanobacteria. This will make you sick whether you drink it or whether you swim in it. You can absorb it through your skin. It causes diarrhea, liver inflammation, vomiting, hemorrhaging. It's not fun stuff, which leads me to ask why this person decided that they were going to scoop it up and show it to us. I just hope that they made it through that okay. Hypoxia. This is something you may have heard of in the Gulf of Mexico in specific for the U.S., but there are Definitely um, hypoxic zones all over the globe. The one down in the Gulf of Mexi New Mexico is um, extremely uh, large. It is actually one of the largest in the world. It is about 7,000 square miles. So everything that has flowed down along through the Mississippi River down into the Gulf of Mexico has created a dead zone. Nothing can live there because there's no oxygen in the water. And this is impacting fishing in the Gulf of Mexico pretty severely. So, you know, this is all crazy news, but what can we do? We have questions. Let's pause. So the first question is, what factors influence the reliability and availability of the water supply? Okay, there's going to be a couple different things there. If we're drawing water directly from a water source, such as a river or a lake, obviously the size, the, the level of the water in that body of water is going to be an uh, impact how much water we can draw off of it. And it does need to be treated in advance of being put through a, a drinking water system. So there's a time lag involved there. So that's always going to impact it. And when we look at the aquifers below the ground and we're pulling groundwater to drink, now, if we're to think of sticking a straw in a cup, if you're sucking out water out of that cup, it's going to get empty. Well, it takes a long time for that water to filter back down through the soil to get back into that aquifer, longer than the time it took for us to suck it out. So we have a, an imbalance there where we're drawing down our aquifers faster than they can refill, which is why cities such as Joliet have chosen to change their water supplies to Lake Michigan because they feel that that's a more um, reliable source of water. 
Okay, so the next question is, are there any measures that are in place to diversify the water supply to ensure that we are not dependent on only one water supply? Hmm. Well, there's not a lot of places we can go. There's not a lot of diversification available to us. As Joliet has done, they have gone to Lake Michigan to get their water. Um, the, the best thing that we can do is do what we can to conserve water and to not use it as rapidly as we are. Um, utilizing gray water in a, as opposed to clean water if it's not something that requires potable water, like flush your toilet with gray water. These kinds of systems can help us not to draw so hard on the clean water systems. So the next one is, is climate change affecting the water temperature of the Fox River and what effects does that have? Mm. Well, I would definitely think that climate change is going to change the temperature of the water. It's changing the temperature of the ocean water. So certainly our tiny little Fox River is going to be impacted by climate change. It's going to change uh, how much water is available because of obviously evaporation and transpiration is going to change with the temperature changes. It's also going to change who's living in the water. It's going to change our uh, microinvertebrates. It's going to change, the, for instance, the, the mussels that live there that help to filter the water. It's going to have a significant impact on the quality of the water that we are, are taking from there as well. Okay, and final question is, what role do stakeholders such as governments play in managing and safeguarding the water supply? We have a huge role at a government level to, to protect that water supply. It is a primary role for us here at the district. It's also what the IEPA and the US EPA are working on. Army Corps of Engineer works very heavily on, on protecting our waterways. We're gonna talk about some of these partnerships a little bit later on. But yes, that is a significant role for these organizations. Okay, do on to those downstream as you would have those upstream do on to you. We do need to change our culture to preserve, protect and restore our water. So here's some of the steps that we can take at home, at work, our governments can take. In suburban areas, we can change from a just an unnatural water body where the, the shorelines here are, are eroded, they're not planted out with native species. We can instead create a native planting with stabilized shores that's going to actually keep soil from eroding down into the waterways and those plants will help to filter their root systems, help to filter the water that enters that waterway. We can also look at our agricultural conservation practices, nutrient management, not using um, chemicals that we don't really need on a, on a field and utilizing only that what we really need, planting cover crops so that we keep the soil in place and continue the filtration of the water that does fall on those fields. We can do conservation tillage, no-till and strip-till where we stop disturbing the structure of the soil so that it can do its job in filtering and holding the water in place. We can also do things in our construction on a day-to-day -day basis. We can either jump right into that river and start sludging around in there to do some kind of construction, or we can protect it while we're working and we can put in booms and cofferdams that will keep a protected work area and keep us from degrading the water that we're working through. On our roadsides, this is not the kind of storm drain that I wanna see. We've got a lot of silt in the water there that's running down into our storm drain. There's a lot of trash going down there. There's leaves and sticks and stuff. This is not stuff that we want to be going down into our storm drains, which go directly out into our waterways. We wanna keep those storm drains clear. We don't wanna dump anything down in them. We want to make sure that we're managing them. If you have one outside of your house, take it upon yourself to steward it and make sure it, stay, it keeps clear. Our landscaping, we can either have a monoculture of non-native turf grass, or we can have a vibrant native ecosystem planted that's going to help to filter water and to keep it in place in the soil and not um, allow erosion. Let's talk a little bit more about those native plants. This is a great graphic that I really love to look at. On the far left there, you see turf grass. Turf grass has got teeny tiny little roots that just barely hold it on the soil. It's not native to our area and it does not do any good for managing stormwater or for filtering the water that's coming down into the soil. And then they don't stabilize the soil either. 
Whereas when you look at those prairie plants, look at the roots, look at how deep down they drive, some of them as far as 15 feet. So those roots will hold the soil in place. They'll help to filter the water. They'll take up the water that's that's coming down from the rainfall and will help to prevent flooding and erosion. They also help to sequester carbon. So when we're talking about keeping a carbon neutral, that's a place where in those roots the, that carbon is being held hostage and kept out of the atmosphere. We can also have very different kinds of pavement. We can have a parking lot that's just straight up asphalt or concrete and all the water runs off of there and it picks up whatever pollutants might happen to be on the pavement. Or we can put in permeable paving. This is the kind of thing where the water can infiltrate down between the cracks of the bricks and the soil can do its filtering job before recharging our aquifers. Everybody's got to wash their car. Winter's ending now and we got yuck all over our cars. Well, if you wash it in your yard or on your driveway, all of that ick is being washed right into the ground. Whereas when you wash it in a car wash, a car wash is required to send their water to a sewer system that will treat it rather than flushing it right down into our waterways. Questions? So the first one is how have how have advancements in technology influenced the efficiency and sustainability of water use practices? Not as much as they should. We have a long way to go. And the, the best place that we can start is at home with the things that we do. And then we can, we can advocate for our legislators to put together programs that are going to drive industry that's going to be more water use conscious. And that agriculture, that's one of the things that we work pretty strongly here at the district. We work with the NRCS, we work with farmers to ensure that the practices that they're using on their farms are going to be sustainable and long-term and not damage our waters. Okay, so the next question is, how has the demand for water changed over time in response to population growth, industrial mm -hmm. and urbanization? Well, when you think about 80 to 100 gallons per person on average per day, the more people that we put on this planet, the more you multiply it out. It's a huge water draw. We definitely have to consider how much water we use individually, be as conscious as we can about our, our use of the resource, and how can we best utilize, again, gray water and um, utilize options that don't, the adoptional ways of doing things that aren't going to be using fresh water. And then our last question for now is how do you convince people that fresh water is a precious resource when we can see it falling from the sky? And how do you show people mm. how much water is in the aquifers? Ah, okay. There are organizations that track how much water is in the aquifers so that we can it, we can monitor our drawdown. It's a definitely, it, there's a, a lot of data out there on the IEPA um, and also on the US EPA. How can we... Wow. Okay. How can you talk anybody into anything? We really need to understand that water is a limited resource and that it is in all of our best interest to take care of it because it's going to impact us right now. I mean, when you think about climate change was supposed to be something that was not going to be impacting us today. And yet now we're seeing the impact right now, right now. It's not a future thing. It's not for my grandkids. It's not even my kids. It's me. I'm seeing this happen. So we we all, it's in all of our best interest to take care of our water, something that all of us need. We are actually going to talk a little bit later about some assignments that we can, things that we can do. Um, so here's some things that we can do in our own homes. We can choose water saver um, faucets and toilets. We can Monitor how long of a shower we're taking. No, never flush medications. This is one of the things that goes directly out. It's not filtered out by our, our water treatment plants. So that medication is going right out into the waterway and it's coming back in our water supplies. Um, checking for leaky toilets. We don't want to be wasting water just in a leak anywhere in the house. When you brush your teeth, here's a really easy one. Turn the water off on the faucet. And the kinds of soaps that you choose also matter whether they're for cleaning you, for cleaning your clothes, for cleaning your house, choose eco-friendly options that are not gonna impact the environment. Other things that we can do at home. We don't wanna be watering the road. I'm really not sure what's going on there. We, if you need to water something, please water it and not everything around it. 
Uh, we're going to use less road salt because, again, that is going to be impacting our water quality. It is a contaminant. We're going to plant those native plants, you know, planting rain gardens, allow those plants that have for thousands of years filtered the water and cleaned it for us to continue to do so. Using rain barrels gives us the opportunity to collect rainwater, and then we can water our plants for free. We don't have to pull water from the system, from the water system. And here's one for those of you, us who, you know, we have dogs. Uh, dog who, dog doo-doo, is pollution. This is something that's going to run off of, the, if you don't pick it up, it's going to run off into the river and it's going to pollute our drinking water. And just a fun statistic here, 21 billion pounds of dog dew every year in the United States alone. So please pick up after your pooch and dump it into the trash. Now let's talk about some of the partners that we have as we go through this. We are not alone. Yes, the government is out there. Uh, units of government like the district, federal units, state units, other local units, the municipalities and communities around us, organizations, and you. We individually are actually some of the most important players because when we speak up, the others will follow. One of the nice and neat little field trips that you can do, if you go to Costco for shopping on Randall Road in St. Charles, Right out in front is the Kane County Farm Bureau, and they have installed a rain garden. And they didn't just install any old rain garden. They installed one that's in the shape of the state of Illinois. It is totally worth going to see. Those waterways there that you see are, in fact, mimicking the rivers of the state of Illinois. And that is where the water that runs off of their, their parking lot, right up on the top of the picture there, that water runs along these waterways and they have native plantings all throughout there, which is, it's really a cool installation. And it tells you all about how important rain gardens can be in helping to manage our stormwater runoff. You can volunteer for cleanups. These are opportunities that go on all over the Fox River watershed all the time. You can get out there and you can clean the trash out of our waterways. Friends of the Fox River is one of the groups that is one of a partner of ours. They have actual educational experiences and students can act as scientists getting out into the water and collecting and analyzing and checking on the water quality. That QR code will take you right to their website so that you can sign up for these kinds of events. Our Fox River just in 2023 was designated as a national water trail. So just like the Appalachian Trail is for hiking, the River Trail is for paddling. On their website, they have a lot of itineraries and maps available so you can get out on the Fox River and enjoy the incredible scenery and help to support it by taking care of it. Again, we're going to talk about salt. Salt in the winter on the roads. We need to be safe, but we need to use the right amount of salt and the right kind of salt. Another partner of ours, the Conservation Foundation, they have a salt smart program to help reduce that salt pollution in our water. Runoff from our roads goes right into our waterways, untreated with all of that salt on board. Here is a picture of, that shows all the different watersheds, active watershed plans here in Northeastern Illinois. So every watershed is our goal that every watershed has a plan. So we have an opportunity to take care of the threats to each particular watershed. The Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, CMAP, is another partner that we uh, work with. They take a very active role in watershed planning in process uh, processes in tandem with SWCDs and other organizations. Here's the United States Environmental Protection Agency. They just released a new guidance document. This is a document, it's a land use and green infrastructure scorecard. This helps local municipalities protect their water sources with the help of green infrastructure practices that will help to guide their urban development in sustainable uh, ways of, of uh, expanding. You, again, coming back to each and every one of us, when you step out to your career plan for the future, your future year has a lot of different options where your career path can take you to directly impacting water and soil conservation and restoration. And even if you choose a job that does not directly uh, operate within one of these parameters, you can add being water and salt smart to any job. You can 
bring composting into your kitchen at your workplace. You can make sure that recycling is done. There's a lot of different things that you can do. Water saver faucets at the break room or in the in the restroom. There's a lot of different ways that you can impact your work workspace, even if you're not working directly with conservation. So let's talk about spring break and something that you can do over spring break. Uh-oh, there's questions. Let's do that first. All right. So the first question that we have is what innovative technologies and approaches show promise in addressing water scarcity and optimal water usage? Hmm. Okay. At the individual level, there's great uh, appliances and faucets and toilets that are coming out there. They're perhaps a little annoying to use because your water pressure doesn't seem to be as high, but they do a great job of mitigating how much water you're using when you're flushing a toilet or showering. Um, energy efficient washers and dryers and dishwashers, these are good choices to make at home. Then as we go to a larger scale, there's a lot of um, new in te technologies that are coming into industry that will allow them to utilize water differently as in the processes that where they need them. We need to continue to draw attention to these things. When you think about, for instance, the jeans that you're wearing, the blue dye that goes into them at the factory level, that blue dye in the water that they're using to dye the jeans is flushing right out into the waterways in some cases. So people need to be aware of these things and to bring them to the attention so that people can put filtration systems in place that will prevent that. Okay, the next question is, would permeable surfaces help replenish the groundwater supply? Absolutely. When we have a, a an impervious surface, the water simply sits on top of it and runs off into the nearest waterway. And it takes all the pollutants that it might pick up along the way and washes that off with it. When you have that permeable surface and you allow the water to infiltrate straight down into the soil, the soil can then do its filtration process that it's been doing for millennia. And ultimately, it takes a very long time. We're not talking about days or weeks or months even. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of years for it to infiltrate all the way down to the aquifers. But it's got to start. We have to start by putting down the, the pervious surfaces so that we can allow that water through instead of letting it run off and be polluted. And then our last question for now is, how can some economical incentives help encourage mm -hmm. A lot of times a carrot will work better than a stick, right? But in order to fund those things, we need to have legislation that provides some kind of, of dollars for that. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act has some different opportunities within it that we're utilizing to help incentivize farmers. Uh, when you do make a change in a farming practice that uh, changes the way you do your work on a farm, it costs money because you're going to lose some crop yield while you're learning to do this new way. So our cost share programs, which we do offer with utilizing federal dollars, helps the farmer to get over that hump and to continue to do conservation practices that are better for the water and the soil, but not perhaps hit him so hard in the pocketbook. So over spring break, here's what I'd like you to do. Choose one water quality enhancement that you will do personally, that you will take on. Shorter showers, turn off the faucet while you're brushing your teeth. Um, encourage you to have in, install uh, faucets that are water savers. Do something at home. Install native plants that you don't have to water with the city water because they are accustomed to growing here and they will grow without being artificially watered. And then take one water quality enhancement and teach somebody else about that. Now you've spread the word. It's very simple. It's very easy for just one person to start a new thing and encourage them to tell somebody else too. It's a game of telephone, right? As soon as somebody tells somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, we get more and more impact on how we're treating our water. And then, you know, I wouldn't mind hearing about them in April when you come back from spring break. What did you do? What was the response of the people that you were talking with? It is challenging to get people to change their behavior, but if they understand the reasons why and it impacts them directly personally, they uh, you got a greater chance of them having making a change. There's an opportunity coming up in March. Wild Ones of Greater Kane County had their Down to the Creek series. They've had two of these sessions already, and on March 19th, they will have another session which talks directly to what can I do at home to help to protect my watershed.
If you're a data geek and you'd like to take a look at some different things, the EPA does have a website out there that you can go to and you can uh, take a look at what our waterway right outside your, if you live on Blackberry Creek, you can go take a look at what's going on on Blackberry Creek. It's a great tool to play around with. It is at mywaterway.epa.gov. Some other sites that you can play with, the runoff simulation, you can take a top one there, you can take and change the ground cover, the land cover from uh, just straight up green to a cityscape, and it will show you exactly how much water is moving in which direction and what impact it has when you make an impervious surface upon the ground. There's also an opportunity for worldwide, you can play with watersheds all over the world and see where they start and where they run to. Beyond that, um, are there any more questions that have come in? I'm kind of done, unless somebody else has something else they'd like to ask. Doesn't look like we have any new ones. Oh, yep, actually we do. So the first one, do air pollution and water pollution have any correlation? Well, if you think about the stuff in the air, when the, the rain rains down, it picks up all of the pollution from the air, or not all of it, but some of it, and it will dump it down into the waterways. So yes, there is gonna be some correlation, but primarily the waters are polluted by the things that are running off of the land. Okay, the next question is, how does land use and planning and watershed management practices contribute to water quality enhancement efforts? This is exactly the route that we need to take. When we are cognizant about what we're doing and how we're developing on our urban side, what we're doing in, in building, in paving, all of those things we need to be very aware of how we're doing that, how much we're doing that, and what the practices are that we're doing that with. Watershed plans identify exactly what the challenges are within each watershed, and then we can do our urban development and our restoration projects to directly address the situations in that particular watershed. So these are very important tools. Another question was, what are some things that you do at the Cane to Page Soil and Water Conservation District to kind of help with this issue? Absolutely. So we have a bunch of different plans that we have in place, both for the agricultural side and for the urban side. We in agriculture, as I said, we work with the NRCS on the federal level and with the Illinois Department of Agriculture to bring conservation practices out to the farmers, to help teach them, help them start up these practices and help them continue these practices, both with our expertise, we can consult with them, and we can also provide them with some cost share dollars so that they can get through that hump of having to make this transition. Um, we also work with local landowners. We can come out to, to uh, someone has an acreage and they want to plant a native garden in there. They want to put in a rain garden, a pollinator garden. We can also help with that. We have plant sales, native plant sales, where you can come and source some of those native plants from us directly. We do well water testing, or right now we're doing well water testing for the area where you can come and get a test from us and test your well water to see what might be, what pollutants might be in there. We also work on the urban side. We work very closely with the Kane County and DuPage County municipalities, and we go out and work with the Illinois EPA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and inspect uh, construction sites to ensure that the construction is being managed in a way that does not harm our waterways and that takes care of the soil that's on that site. Okay, and the next question is, who are the largest contributors in terms of corporations in ru ruining our water? Oh, specifically names? I really don't know that I can answer that. It's that we're all culpable, every one of us. You know, when we dump paint down a storm drawer, a storm sewer, then we we are responsible for that. That's pollution. Okay, so the next question is how effective are the current water techniques that are helping climate change? Not sure I understand the question there. I think they're kind of asking like how the current water techniques are supporting like us finding solutions to the problems that we have right now with the water. Well, we, we have identified a lot of different ways that we can uh, impact 
not having such damage to the water. So we can do things that will mitigate our damaging the water. And then we, we have a lot of people who are working on how can we clean the water that we have. This is part of our, our drinking water filtration systems. Um, the, the best solution for the problem is really prevention. We really need to get out in front of it and prevent the issues on the, on the front side. Okay, the next question is, is well water safer than city water? Ah, okay. Well, when you think about city water, it has gone through a, a treatment plant, right? So it has been cleaned of as much as they can treat for. Uh, as I said, if we have um, medications, this is not something you want to be flushing down the toilet because the systems don't pick that up and it will just keep circulating in our drinking water. Um, well water... It can be very clean, but when you think about it, things are filtering down through the soil, right? Is it Has it been cleaned out completely before it hits your well? This is where well water testing is actually really important. If you live near a farm, for instance, you might be picking up bacteria from the livestock. So there's a lot of things that, that are, you need to track, and well water testing is a great way to make sure that that's happening. And the city is taking care of that on the, on the municipal water supply side for us. And then another question is, what are some techniques recommended for those wanting to begin gardening sustainably? Ah, okay. Well, I would say one of the first things that you can do is putting in a rain barrel so that you're utilizing the rainwater that's falling free from the sky instead of pulling water out of your faucet. Plant native plants because they live here. They know how to live here. They will, they'll grow without you really doing much of anything. They will also help to take care of the soil and water. Limit your use of fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. Don't put chemicals on the ground. And again, the native plants don't really need this stuff. In fact, if you have critters eating your plants in a native garden, that's actually a sign that your ecosystem is working. You are supporting the local ecosystems. You're, you're feeding the bugs that are feeding the birds that are feeding the foxes. You know, it's a big loop. And if you're a part of that, that is an awesome thing. What else you got for me? Uh, next one is how effective are current water techniques in removing pollutants? Well, it depends on the pollutant and it depends on where we're getting a hold of it. If it's something that's just dumping straight from a pipe into a waterway, we're not doing anything. If it's something that's going through our water treatment plant, if it's something that they have identified that they need to filter out and can filter out, they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, when you look at the water that's coming out of the out of the faucet from the city su supply, it's actually really pretty good water. It's you know we're not dealing with a lot of illness. We're not dealing with a lot of um, uh, dirty looking water. That's pretty sediment free, and it's it's not making people sick. So we're doing a fairly good job, but we do need to be really aware of what we're putting in because some of those processes are not picking everything up. The next question, um, someone said that they see small ponds in subdivisions and they're, mm. what their impact is on the watersheds. Okay. Those are called either a retention or a detention basin. And what has happened there, typically when a construction site goes in place, we're changing the land cover. We're putting impervious uh, land cover in place that's going to change how the water moves on the surface of the ground. So we need to give it a place to go. So we dig a detention or a retention pond, and these ponds then are responsible for managing the stormwater that's in that area so that we don't have flooded basements. Those ponds then need to be maintained. They have to be kept dredged because they've been, there's a calculation that says for this much land area, we need this big of a pond. And when there's soil that fills that up, then over time that needs to be dredged back out so that the pond remains at the right size. And you have to have plants in there. Obviously native plants would be the best to be able to filter the water and help to keep it clean. Two different kinds of ponds, one will empty out and you'll see basically just a, an empty dip in the ground. This infiltrates into the ground more quickly and then other ones actually hold water for longer periods of time and it infiltrates out very slowly. Okay, the next question is, what is what do you need to study in college to get a career like yours? Oh, my goodness. Uh, we look for, when we are hiring, we look for people who've taken environmental science. 
Uh, things like soil science classes are really important. Um, anything really to do with uh, and the environment, wildlife, forestry, uh, agriculture, any of the agroecology uh, studies will definitely lend yourself to being able to come and work for us, for the Natural Resource Service, for the IDOA. There's all a lot of opportunities there. They're looking for soil scientists. There's a lot of opportunities, but stick on those environmental science classes, and that's that's where you're going to be get the entry. So, what is the significance of water conservation in protecting endangered species that depend on specific water environments? Mm. As we were talking about a little bit earlier, when the river gets too warm or too polluted then it kills off the creatures that live in there. And a lot of those creatures, they have they perform ecosystem services, they're called, such as the mussels that are living in the river. They filter the water. If you ever do an experiment where you take dirty water and in two different buckets, and you drop some mussels into one of the buckets, you will literally see them clear the, the pollution out of the water. And when we put pollutants and, and chemicals and poisons into that waterway, yeah, we're killing those guys off. So that is that is a big deal. That is a big deal. We need to utilize all the all the friends that we can. Okay, the next question is if a, if city water has a lot of chemicals, would you recommend water bottles as an alternative? Ah, no, I would never recommend a water bottle because that's a carbon intensive um it, you know, first of all the bottle is made of plastic which is a, a petroleum product. So we want to stay away from single use plastic as much as we can. And the water, geez, you've got water right here in your faucet. Why are you trucking a bottle full of water from somebody else's faucet all the way to your door? So it is really the, the a less uh, uh, environmentally friendly option with the exception of when, if there is, for instance, in the hurricane season, when they have a problem with a hurricane damaged water system that is not providing clean water, obviously we need to keep people safe and then bringing in bottled water is the only way to go. There's also Brita filters, you know, you can, you can filter your water at home with a lot of different kinds of filters that filter everything out right down to the heavy metals. All right, so the next question is, how can you tell if your septic system is not working? Oh, well, I would call a septic system guy. I would definitely say that if anything outside smells weird, we definitely need to call a septic system guy in. Monitoring and managing and, and maintaining your septic system is really important. We want to make sure it, that it has a very specific scientific way that it works, and we want to make sure that it is working correctly. So having it serviced on a regular basis is definitely a positive idea. The lift pump can go out. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. So just do maintenance on it. No different than you do maintenance on your uh, furnace. You know, it's just a system you have to take care of. Okay, this is our final question. Um, okay. What role does rainwater harvesting play in residential water conservation efforts? Well, it can it can actually have a very significant role. If we put in a lot of cisterns or rain barrels and people are using the rainwater to water their gardens instead of using the water out of the faucet, that's a huge water savings. Uh, the rainwater you know, that you're using then, it still has an opportunity to infiltrate through the soil because you're using it at a later date than when it rained. And it's still going filtering down through to an in, in its final destination towards the aquifers. Okay, how'd we do? Yeah, we, really oh, we did exactly an hour. Look at that. Mm -hmm. um, we hope to see you again next year. Okay, Thank you so much. excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, of course. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.